Okay, we're in the uh, book of Exodus, the um, first book of redemption in the Scripture, the book in a sense. Exodus is, the, in that sense, then a prelude to the book of Revelation. And we're just finishing up a, uh, I think what we primarily have, uh, have left is chapter 34, right? Okay, um, the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto the Mount Sinai, and pre present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before the mount. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto the Mount Sinai. And the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. You know, one of the things that uh, is worth doing sometime, very interesting study, is to take a concordance and uh, do a, your own study on the name of the Lord. And it's interesting to take that all the way through. Obviously, we introduced some of those ideas and talked a little bit about it. And we took Exodus 3, where it gives you the Ichyach Asher, Ichyach statement of and the burning bush. But you can take it all the way through. And uh, the new name that Jeremiah talks about, Jehovah Tzitkanu and so forth. You can do a very interesting study on the name of the Lord. It's interesting, too, as you do that, to recognize it is the subject of one of the commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. We typically think that refers to profanity. And I don't think so, personally. Not that I'm advocating profanity. Uh, I'm sure I'll be quoted that way this week. No. Um, <laughs> no, I think the, the, the commandment has a much deeper focus. Much deeper focus. I think that, um, that his name is um, very, very special, very precious, very unique, very important throughout the Scripture. Uh, there are some groups that make a big thing to get into tangents on that theme, so I guess you want to go at it with some maturity, make sure you're looking at the whole council. But um, I do commend to you as a springboard for constructive activity to, to uh, pour into his name. Now, do you know what is higher than his name? His word. Very good. A lot of people don't know that. Verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Oh. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. It's interesting... We could spend the whole evening on those few verses, but you can relax. I won't badger that to death, but just to give you the thrust of it, if the Spirit talks to you about this, you can run with it yourself. There are about seven major attributes of God concatenated there, depending on where you put the commas and so forth. But it says, uh, you know, the Lord God, first thing, of course, is merciful. That's probably our most abundant need is for mercy. And gracious and long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, goodness or kindness, if you will, and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty. Now, you know, there's an interesting thing that we could get into Romans on in a whole trip. You can get into Romans deeply on this subject. If you like, you cannot have grace without righteousness. You know, we sometimes as just naive observers sort of figure, gee, if God, want, God loves us, he can forgive us. No, not without violating his deity. And uh, in order for him to be able to forgive us, that is to be merciful or to be gracious to us, there has to be a basis for that. And that's the, the whole cross is all about. That's why this whole elaborate thing is in order to have grace and mercy. The needs of righteousness are satisfied. And interestingly enough, that concept is embedded as early as Exodus. And that will by no means clear the guilty. The guilty are not cleared, you see, just by forgiveness. There's a whole thing of justification and propitiation. And if you want to get into the theology of it, you can go. Your little, it'll take you into Romans. You can go there by long words or shortcuts, but you'll get into Romans on that whole issue. And Moses may... Now, it's interesting, Moses' reaction to all of this 
In fact, it's always the reaction of a man of God throughout the scripture. From here we could get into a whole tedious chain of events. Remember Joshua in Joshua chapter, end of chapter 5, when he's confronted with a captain of the Lord's host, what does he do immediately? Falls on his face and worships. It's interesting, not only did Moses bow his head to the earth and worshiped, he made quick about it. He hustled. He made haste. He, he sensed the urgency of positioning his, himself appropriately before the God of the universe. I wonder if we're as smart as he was. I wonder, you know, we sort of glibly sing our songs and we pack a few faithful promises in our hip pocket to pull out at the right time and reassure ourselves. And, but I wonder if we really understand that we need to be in front of our God trembling and on the ground worshiping him, that he's not some kind of a permissive provider, but rather a holy and righteous God that expects certain responses from us. Responsive worship. Interesting. Moses made haste, bowed his head toward the earth, and worshiped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people, I will do marvels, such as have not been done in all the earth or in any nation. And now this is quite a statement. Now bear in mind who he's talking to. This is a group of people who saw the waters turn into blood, saw the ten plagues of Egypt, the flies and the frogs and the hailstones of fire, and um, of course, obviously, the climactic one, the death of the firstborn. These are the ones that saw the Red Sea itself part so they could go through and at the same time swallow up the mightiest army that was on the face of the earth at that time, Pharaoh's best. And this was the bunch that saw this strange apparition, this pillar of cloud lead them through the wilderness during the day, pillar of fire by night. And God is telling to them that, hey, stand by, we're going to do really wild things. Okay? I mean, it's, you know, if he said that to us, we'd sort of figure, okay. But he's saying this to eyewitnesses who are pretty wild things. He's saying, I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. And indeed it was. We see even we see glimpses of that in the book of Joshua when they go to Jericho and the two guys sneak in there. They talk to Rahab. She's heard about these guys. She's heard the legends, the stories that uh, circulate uh, about this strange nomadic people that God himself leads and fights their battles for them. That must be a strange thing for a, a, a foreign nation to observe. Verse 11, observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, Hivite, and the Jebusite. How many are there there? There's six. That's interesting. We're going to find it seven. Now, six here being the number of man, but you'll find it breaks into seven tribes when we get to Joshua. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves. What kind of groves were they cutting down? Idols. What kind of idols? What were these groves? Posts there? Phallic symbols. Had to do with the whole fertility rites of the Canaanites and so forth. The groves. You can study the groves as you go through the scripture. It's an interesting issue that keeps coming up. For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is... Oh, here's another name for the Lord. Strange name, isn't it? We think of jealous as something undesirable, don't we? You shouldn't be jealous. Jealousy is sort of a something inappropriate. But wait a minute, it's the name of God. 
What's he jealous of? Everything. <laughs> Everything. Girls, when you go into a store to buy yourself a new dress, do you take the Lord along? Help you pick it out? Now, there's two sides to that coin. On the one hand, you can say that he enjoys participating with you in anything that you enjoy. That's of him. And going, picking a new dress with the Lord along is a neat idea. I'm not sure you want to mumble that way. The clerks may um, have a... But, uh, but on the other hand, I suggest that you know, we think of, well, the Lord, he, you know, he cares about me going to church Sunday morning or maybe the Monday night Bible study or whatever. The uh, Lord's probably jealous of all your time and thoughts. And how do we know that? Well, I can think of one way to think of it, and that's what he says is the great commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with how much of your heart? Most of it, huh? Over 50%. <laughs> all your heart. All your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And the mind isn't there in the Old Testament, but that's the way the Lord Jesus Christ quoted it. So I'll take his rendering of it, and I think it's competent. So I'll you know, leave it on that. Um, we don't think of it that way. We don't think that... I mean, I often don't either. I try, I try to, and yet I don't really. Everything we do should be sanctified. Should be whatsoever. You, Paul says, "Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all what to the glory of God." Interesting, isn't it? His name is Jealous. He's a jealous God. Interesting. Not only is that the name of God, it is the name by which He introduces His commandments in Exodus 20, if you recall. The dimension of the Lord that we probably don't think of a lot. We're so used to the soft, comfortable mood we get from some other pair of areas. Was he jealous, just jealous back here? I mean, this is the God of Israel, the God of Moses, this harsh, tough, commandment-oriented kind of guy, right? Of course, all the modern liberal commentators will tell you that's the God of the Old Testament. The God of the New Testament is a different kind of guy, right? I don't think so. Yesterday, today, and forever, the same. So whatever he is here, he is now. I'm not saying he'll treat you under the same rules, because that's a whole other question, but the point that God himself has not changed. Verse 15, Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. Uh, it's interesting to notice that all through the scripture, God calls his people to be separate. His delineation of that with Israel is, of course, quite conspicuous, strikes many of us in a, in a modern anthropological sense as a little quaint. But that's only that way if we look at it in the absence of spiritual insight. God calls his people to be separate. That has not changed. You can do a whole study in the New Testament where we, as his ecclesia, his church, his, his body, are called to be what? To be separate. Does that mean we should be monastic? No. He called us to be witnesses in the world. It's pretty hard to witness if you're cloistered somewhere away from the people you're supposed to witness to. You know, the concept of what I would call the monastic cop-out is not what he's calling us to. But he is calling us to be in the world, but not of the world, to be separate from the world. That's tough to do. It's not easy. It's easy to cop out, you know, even though you may reside right here in River City. You can easily cut yourself off from all kinds of communion with the world. Some of that may be constructive. Some of it may be hindering a witness. And that's a real tough line to walk. I can remember as a Christian businessman early in my spiritual growth, feeling wouldn't it be ideal to have a Christian business where all the people in it were saved, all our customers were saved, all our suppliers were saved. Wouldn't it be neat if you just live within that environment? It took me a while. Number one, to get burned badly. <laughs> through my own lack of experience and also through the re realization that an awful lot of people don't understand the sanctity of a commitment. And uh, Christians uh, are perhaps among the worst. You know, they'll perfectly they'll give you a commitment and against which you spend money and make other commitments, and then they come back and say, well, we've prayed about it and changed our minds. In fact, I heard uh, one friend of mine say, it's, you know, it's really amazing how God changes his mind a lot around here, because these people come in, the Lord led me to do X, and then a week later, the Lord told me to really do Y instead. It's amazing how the Lord seems to change his mind. In fact, what we're having dealing with are often, in some cases, just inexperienced people who don't mean a breach of ethics. They just don't realize that a commitment's supposed to be a commitment. But 
And beyond that, though, it took me a while to get to the mentality. And by the way, I'm not suggesting I'm correct now. I'm just sharing this because it comes up a great deal in some of the other conversations. Is where if I'm looking for, say, an attorney, I have to be honest with you, I don't necessarily, unless there's some special context involved, necessarily look for a guy who's a Christian. I look for the best, if, I, if, if it's a labor relations situation, I look for the best labor relations attorney I can find. Or if it's contract, or whatever the issue is, I look for the best. Uh, because I woke up one day to realize, number one, I needed the best. But secondly, um, I also realized that my very commerce is a mechanism of witness. And it's interesting, the Lord has prospered my way since then, maybe for lots of other reasons too, but I'm just sharing that with you because I notice particularly here in Orange County, you find a lot of people who have as their sort of primary goal uh, to sort of withdraw from the, from the action. And uh, that may be where the Lord leads some of you. I don't want to disparage that. On the other hand, we're really called to be witnesses, and I think you witness where the action is. One of the things that gave me some freedom or some, some comfort in this path was a hypothetical situation that was posed by a friend of mine in which you're laying on an operating table and um, you have an acute pain in your abdomen and several of the doctors have indicated to you you have appendicitis. There's one guy on your left who looks at you with sort of a sneer on his face and he says, I don't know anything about your biblical views but I have been trained to, to do up to appendix operations. I do about 55 a week. I've never lost a patient. It's my specialty. I've been trained for 30 years to do just this and nothing else. I'm the world's best. And you look at him, you look at his credentials, they're impeccable. He's prepared to pull your appendix. <laughs> okay, that, you take comfort in that. He's obviously a professional. He's a, a specialist. But he happens to be an agnostic on the right side, you've got a friend of yours from down the street who says, uh, you know, the Lord's spoken to me, <laughs> and he's called me to pull your appendix. <laughs> I've never done it before, but I really feel led of the Lord that I'm to take the scalpel and start digging away. And of course, you can, you can model this even more colorfully, but uh, uh, it's an interesting dilemma because you can, paint, you can paint some interesting choices. And I guess what I'm really getting at, I'm very impressed with the Christian movement called Athletes in Action. You all probably have heard of them. It's, uh, we're very aware of their movement. And they've, they have an interesting witness. But it's interesting how they go about their witness. They try to find, say, the best high jumper in the world and lead him to the Lord. They don't take a Christian and try to make him the best high jumper in the world. Okay? There is a, a wisdom of dealing with competent talent. And um, so I think this whole business of being a witness means being in the world, not of it. I mention that because it was a struggle for, oh, I guess, gee, it's more than 12 years ago. I went through quite a crisis for quite a few years as we struggled with a number of good, well-meaning Christian executives trying to get several things together, only to finally learn very slowly and very painfully that the Lord seemed to want us doing some other things, mixing, not, not being a monastic order in the, in the middle of some uh, business environment. Oh, anyway, let's, I got off the track here. But there is a thing about being separate at the same time, because, in fact, by being of the world, being too married to certain things, one can go, as, the, as Moses says here, a whoring after other gods. Verse 17, thou shalt make thee no molten gods. Now we get into an interesting uh, run-through of some feasts. The feast of the unleavened bread shalt thou keep. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread, as I commanded thee in the month in the time of the month of Abib, for in the month of Abib thou camest from Egypt. Nizan and Abib are equivalent terms, by the way, if, you've, if that confuses you. All that opened the matrix is mine, and every firstling among thy cattle, whether ox or sheep, that is male. But the firstling of an ass shalt thou redeem with a lamb, and if thou redeem him not, then thou shalt break his neck. Interesting. Now, we had a study of this. Let's see if you remember. I've forgotten which book it was where we got into this whole side trip of what, typologically speaking, is the ass. 
The natural man. Remember that? The natural man. You can make quite a study of that. And if I go through it, that doesn't prove anything. It's another one of Chuck Missler's weird ideas. What you do is get a concordance and poke around and see if that's what you see. If you do, praise God. And it seems to be valid. If that's what you see, then maybe, gee, maybe it's wrong. You know. The lamb is the animal of redemption. The jackass, that's you and me, guys. We need redemption. And when we're redeemed, we're redeemed by what? Another donkey? Uh-uh. By a lamb. Now, you may say, gee, what are you making here? I'm, I'm suggesting the Holy Spirit deals in puns. Some of them are amusing. All of them are deadly serious. All the firstborn of thy sons shalt thou redeem. None shall appear before me empty. Six days shalt thou work, but on the seventh day thou shalt rest. In earing time and in harvest thou shalt rest. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. What's the feast of ingathering? Tabernacles. Thrice in the year shall all your men, children, appear before the Lord God and the God of Israel. For I will cast out the nations before thee and enlarge thy borders. Neither shall any man desire thy land when thou shalt go up to appear before the Lord thy God thrice in the year. Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left unto the morning. That's interesting. You know, they take the feast of Passover that night, but they got to consume it that night, not the following morning. Do you know why? They don't want the partaking of that feast separated from the death. The whole issue is the death of that lamb. And that's at least one aspect. There's probably dozens. The first of the first fruits of thy land shalt thou bring unto, unto the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. There's a whole concatenation of little ordinances here. This business of the first fruits, you can't tell from this. You've got to get into Joshua and elsewhere to prove it. But that the first fruits was, was celebrated the morning after the Sabbaths were passed. And it turns out that's Sunday morning. When did the Lord rise from the dead? Sunday morning. What was he representative of? The first fruits of them that slept. Hmm? Interesting. Now, this phrase, thou shalt not seethe a kid in his mother's milk, is one of these strange little things tucked away in here, but it's not just here, it's in three places in the Torah. And it's the basis for the whole idea of the kosher rules in which you do not have milk and beef together in the same meal. If you're in Israel and you go to a, either a buffet or a reception or a restaurant, you'll have two bars. You can go in one area where they'll serve you know, beef and related kinds of things. You go to another place where they'll have dairy products. So you can't get your cheeseburger and a shake. It just doesn't really work that way there. <laughs> and believe it or not, you try to unravel the, you know, behind the rabbinical traditions that have uh, been built on these kosher rules. It goes back to this phrase. And you and I, may, that may strike us as strange. And at the same time, um, that's, that's, that's its uh, initial root. Now, whether that's valid or whether it's just a concatenation or twisting of a rabbinical mind through the centuries is a, a subject for a whole other discussion. Verse 27, the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. Now, a very important point. You know, the covenant he's talking about here is different than the covenant by which he brought them here. The covenant he, by which he brought them out of Egypt was a covenant with whom? Abraham. Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and so forth. That covenant was a one-party covenant. It was unconditional. Remember that night when, when it was dark sleep on Abraham and... He had the, saw the thing cut and the flame go between the pieces to confirm it. How many, who went between the pieces? One party, God himself. One party covenant, unconditional. An unconditional relationship. There's nothing that Israel could do to forfeit her rights under that relationship. And that's a concept that the church, the classical Orthodox church for 19 centuries has missed because they've taken the position for 1900 years that Israel forfeited her rights to the promises of the Old Testament by her rejection of the Messiah in Judea some 1900 years ago. 
wrong. She may be suffering for having rejected her Messiah, but that's got nothing to do with the covenant with Abraham. And that means it's got nothing to do with her rights to the land. We live in a time, you know, it was for centuries, this was just a big controversy, but we live in a very interesting time because Zechariah and some of the other prophets point out that the entire world is going to go, go to war over this issue. And that sounds unthinkable, that in our sophisticated society, in our world of nuclear weapons, in our world of man's ascendancy to these higher forms of learning, that we would all go to war, would plunge the planet Earth into a nuclear holocaust over a few square miles of real estate in the Middle East, mostly desert. Not even oil-rich lands, simply Israel's right to the land. We have uh, one of the major burdens before most of the capitals of the world, the so-called Palestinian problem, which probably will not get a fair hearing until the PLO is done with, because they're probably the main adversary to the real interests of the Palestinian in the first place. But anyway, it's interesting. Incidentally, uh, the other evening, I had an occasion to share with you this peculiar little news article. Some of you may remember I read it from you, a little article that was published in the Review of the News about the village of Saida, where apparently, so the article would have us believe, the Israelis overran not just that part of Beirut, adjacent to Beirut, but uncovered a military command post, the likes of which we didn't know existed on the planet. Underground steel vaulted chambers accessible by submarine from the sea, vaults containing fleets of helicopters, indexed files on 2,000 members of terrorist organizations in Europe and in America, and nuclear weapons, etc., etc., etc. The article appeared in a magazine. I shared it with you that night. A few friends of mine had also heard it on the radio earlier. And suddenly, not a word, not a peep, right? In fact, several of my friends, and I also have to share with you, I felt the same way, felt the credibility of that whole article was clouded because you would think there would be more visibility of it all. Well, I had an interesting experience uh, this past week, um, last week, I should say. I had the opportunity to have a, attend a, you know, a home a discussion in a home with uh, General Shlomo Gazit, who was, up until some months ago, the head of military intelligence for the state of Israel. And he was here on other issues, and he had uh, we had a discussion. But prior to that discussion, privately, I took him aside, and we got a chance to get acquainted and chat about a few things. I obviously couldn't resist. I asked him, I says, uh, you know, I, I'm very puzzled because there was some rumbles for a while of this command post, presumably found under Saida. And he looked at me kind of strange, and he says, yes, yeah, Saida, you, and you first do it, he says, you must mean Sidon. And I didn't realize that that's the, Saida was the, is not the, the name they use. They use the biblical name, Sidon. And in the pace of events since then, I've been too busy. I've been wanting to dig into my library and start indexing the prophecies about Sidon. Because I think that would be very interesting. But he also indicated to me that uh, not only the, the report's valid, but he says, do you take Aviation Week? And those of you that know Aviation Week apparently can go back through your files some months ago, not sure exactly how long, where apparently it recounts the capture of a very strange piece of machinery, Soviet-built machinery, which is a machine of some incredible technology for rapid tunneling through all kinds of materials. This machine was acquired as part of the raid and was dismantled and studied by the Israelis and others, I assume, and was reported in Aviation Week for those of you that would like to chase that sort of thing. So I have several interesting reactions. First of all, I'm embarrassed as a student of prophecy that I haven't been more focused on the village of Sidon, because much is said about Sidon in the scripture. I'm not sure whether or not this bears on this. It may. And, and it is, of course, on the coast, and that's why it's so easy to tunnel and make it give submarine access for Soviet officers, officers to get in and out of this command post. Uh, but the other thing, of course, it's interesting that as we go about our routine business, that major confrontations are occurring that we are just not, we don't have visibility of. Um, the intelligence estimates that I have heard uh, is that this may have bought us two years, this whole maneuver. The other thing that gives us very pa great pause, I think, is I've had now about four occasions to converse with people who have come from Lebanon 
and all of them have communicated the same issue to me, namely that there's absolutely no relationship between what they see going on there and the news that's reported here. And I never realized personally, even I regard myself as a reasonably sophisticated executive, reasonably well informed about a lot of matters, I've never taken seriously the accusations that our news media is that well managed. I would think it just the other way around. I think if you tried to manage it, it would be difficult. But apparently it's closely held enough that uh, it's possible, in fact, very obvious that it is. It's never been obvious to me until this incident. Up till now, I've always felt there was just a question of controversies or bias or editorial bias. There's something else going on, and it's uh, very, very carefully managed. But it's interesting that um, the world is under tension, significant tension, over this very issue, the claim of Israel to the land, a claim that's a very interesting claim, a claim that God gave it to them, a claim that underlies the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, and doesn't achieve a resolution until someone shows up with the title deed for it. And he shows up in Revelation 5. In the right hand of him who sat on the throne, there was a book sealed with seven seals written within and on the back side. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? The lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He will show forth his title and dispossess the usurpers. If you want a model of what happens, look at the book of Joshua. That's a small prelude of what's coming. Where the leader, Yehoshua, takes command of his host and dispossess seven nations, led by Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness, he calls himself. Verse 28, And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. It came to pass, by the way, you know, it's interesting, you should not, I shouldn't pass over this flippantly, that was not really appropriate. It's interesting that all the great men of God fasted prior to their ministry. It's also interesting, if you look carefully, you'll generally find a reference to 40 days and 40 nights. And the best example is who? Jesus, Jesus himself. The whole issue, after his baptism, he went into the wilderness to pray. And it was at the end of those 40 days and 40 nights that Satan used the opportunity to try to tempt him. His fast was over. So turning the stones to bread wasn't breaking his fast, but it was invoking his authority when his mission was to be subject to the Father and do his acts by the power of the Holy Spirit, not his own as the Son of God. Interesting. What uh, Satan was really offering him was a shortcut. Don't go by the cross, but go the quick way. And praise God, he chose not to. Verse 29, it came to pass when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand when he came down from the Mount that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And inward, afterward all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with him, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took, off the, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. An interesting testimony of his communion with the Lord, but also typologically prophetic. What does it speak of? Transfiguration, Matthew 17. I have tried, clumsily perhaps, but to try to look at some of these things mystically, or symbolically, or allegorically, or by analogy. And um, I do that for several reasons. I think there's non-obvious lessons there. Secondly, I think it's useful for us to get in the habit of doing that, not to make doctrine, because I think it really, you can get really trapped in some weird ideas that way, but simply as a way of focusing our horizon on the whole body of the truth of the Scripture. God does deal in patterns. And we know from Hosea 12.10 and other patterns, 1 Corinthians and other places, that he intends for us to understand his patterns and learn from them. 
And uh, so it's sometimes, and because of that, I use that as my excuse to look for comparisons. It's interesting to put things in juxtaposition. Whenever you see two things, you'll notice always through scripture, you'll see two things side by side. You know, uh, Isaac and Ishmael and so forth, Jacob and Esau and uh, so on. And whenever that happens, Hagar and Sarah and so forth. You'll discover that the Holy Spirit typically is doing that for a purpose. That in addition to the two people, and they were real live people with real live problems, the, the Holy Spirit also using that to draw some broader idea. And so we've done that throughout our study whenever we get a chance. But there's another principle that we've uh, uncovered in some of our previous get-togethers. And that is when you have a body of scripture, especially one that is puzzling, confusing, knotty, all fouled up, you can't seem to understand what on earth it's all about, there is a secret that I will share with you. In fact, it's, it's fun to discover a passage that's absolutely unintelligible, because then you have a chance to do an interesting experiment. There's two experiments you can do. One experiment you do, and I really, I'm, I'm saying this literally, by the way, take a diary or a notebook and write down on a piece of paper your feelings, your thoughts, your attempts to understand a particular passage. You come across a passage, you really can't make head or tail of it. Terrific. Write down, document for yourself, not for somebody else, for yourself, the date and what it is you have trouble with. Try to describe this crazy passage that doesn't make any sense. And write down, document why this makes no sense. Okay? When you finish doing that, put it aside. Put the word aside, too. Pray about it. Say, okay, Father, you've told me that, only, that these things, the natural man discerneth not. Right? But they're spiritually discerned. So I ask you for the Holy Spirit to illuminate this for me. And then you can go back to the passage, either then or the next morning or sometime, and watch what happens. You have an opportunity to conduct a laboratory experiment in the field of spiritual learning. Because it's interesting. It will become so obvious to you, so clear, that you will have difficulty remembering or rationalizing why you were so confused. That's why it's important to document your confusion first. You go back and say, because it'll remind you how puzzled and how frustrated you were. Now, there's another thing that's sort of analogous to the same thing I'm saying. And the other way you sort of gain a spiritual insight on something like this is put Jesus Christ right in the middle of whatever it is that's bothering you. By analogy, by whatever, any of several ways. Jesus Christ said that the volume of the book, it is written of whom? Me. Okay, that should not surprise us. That let's take a, I like to, this is sort of by way of taking a look at Moses. We all know Moses. We have mental visions of the small child in the Ark of the Bulrushes. And we all see you know, him growing into Charlton Heston and giving Yul Brenner his. <laughs> Moses. He's an interesting set of contradictions. He's a child of a slave, yet son of a king. He was born in a hut, yet lived in a palace. He inherited poverty, yet enjoyed unlimited wealth. He was a leader of armies, and then a keeper of flocks. The mightiest of warriors, and yet the meekest of men. He was educated at court, yet he dwelt in the desert. He possessed the wisdom of Egypt, and yet had the faith of a child. He was fitted for the city, yet he wandered in the wilderness. He was tempted with the pleasures of sin, yet endured the hardships of virtue. He was backward in speech, yet he talked with God. He held the rod of a shepherd, but it was backed by the power of the infinite. He was a fugitive from Pharaoh, and yet an ambassador for the Most High God. He was a giver of the law, and yet a forerunner of grace. He died alone on Mount Moab, but appeared with Christ in Judea. No one assisted at his funeral. God himself buried him. His lips are silent, yet his voice speaks to us today. It's obviously not original. I am Haldeman. It's something I lifted, but I was impressed with. Interesting, interesting person. One, a biography worth studying for many, many reasons, not the least of which is one I haven't come to yet. I'm going to turn to Deuteronomy 18. 
It's one of these prophecies that has many, many meanings, probably. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. If you recall, when John the Baptist was creating a commotion out in the desert, that the leadership in, the, in Jerusalem sent their staff guys out there to do a study, find out what's going on. They asked him three questions. Are you the Messiah? He says, no, I'm not. Are you Elijah? He says, no, I'm not. He says, are you that prophet? And in John, unless you study John carefully, you may not realize they're, re they're making reference to this passage in Deuteronomy. And it has to do with their expectation that Moses, or one like Moses, was to show up. This verse in verse 15 can be looked at as being messianic, pointing to Christ himself. On the other hand, there's also a, a powerful view that I also subscribe to, that it re refers to one of the two witnesses. I personally am among those that has a view, just a view, that the two witnesses in Revelation 11 are Moses and Elijah. And I won't bore you with that whole side trip. You can get it on the Revelation tapes if you're interested. The point is, though, certainly this issue of the Messianic view and, and, and Moses in the sense of a prophet are at least close enough that I can use it as a springboard to ask you, see if there are ways that Moses can be viewed as a type or a model of Jesus Christ. In any case, let's first of all talk about nationality. Moses was what? An Israelite. Exodus tells us that. Where was he, what was Jesus Christ? Jewish. Okay. Often we get into these functions. Um, some, we're right, quite active on behalf of Israel and some of these fundraising things and so forth. And people say, Chuck, are you Jewish? He says, gee, I really don't know, but the God I worship is. And it's kind of fun. They know how to deal with that one. Um, interesting. Let's talk about their birth. Both men, Moses was born under a time of Gentile bondage. Egypt. Jesus was born in Bethlehem under a time of Gentile bondage. Matthew 2 and Luke 24, etc. Okay. We could go into a lot of other things in terms of his person being f deemed fair. We get Moses' description of Acts chapter 7, verse 20, which is Stephen, and of course uh, Christ in Luke 2, and so on. Interesting, both of them had their lives endangered when they were born. Pharaoh ordered his soldiers to slaughter the babies. What happened to Jesus? Remember Herod? Same thing. Strange coincidence, isn't it? Adoption. Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, right? Therefore, he had a mother, but no father. He was technically legally adopted by Pharaoh, of course. Interesting, if Matthew chapter 1, we have the same view of Jesus Christ, in the sense that Joseph was his adopted father. Interesting. You can make a big thing out of the fact that his name was Joseph, too, if you want to go on that trip. Childhood. Both men were raised in Egypt. Isn't that interesting? Obviously Moses was, but we forget. Remember Matthew in chapter 2, verse 13, makes a point that Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, was fulfilled out of Egypt, I have called my son. Both obviously had sympathy for Israel. Moses had his heart with his brethren, even though he was removed from them by station, he chose to join them. They each had an early knowledge of their mission. Stephen tells us that about Moses in Acts chapter 7. And of course, Luke chapter 2 uh, gives us insight into our Lord. Both had a, uh, a condescending grace. In, in uh, Exodus chapter 2, we know that Moses chose to be with his brethren, gave up the court for his brethren. And of course, Hebrews 2.11 says the same thing. In fact, in both cases, it's chapter 2, verse 11. In both cases, Hebrews 2.11, Jesus was not ashamed to call them brethren. Uh, they both had a great renunciation. We looked at that last time. Remember last time we looked at Hebrews 11? Verses 24 through 26, where Moses renounce, renounces his station. And, of course, that corresponds to Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7, where our Lord humbled himself to be obedient even to the cross. Both men were rejected by their brethren. Moses was rejected by his brethren. Acts chapter 2, verses 26 and 27 describes that, interestingly enough. And, of course, 
John opens his gospel. He came unto his own, his own received him not, and so forth. Luke 19, 14, and other places. Both of them journeyed among the Gentiles. Moses went to Midian, and Acts 15, 14, our Lord also. Both had a seat on a well. Exodus 2, 15, and of course, John 4, remember? Okay, and incidentally, both wells were outside the land. Moses' well was where? At Midian. The Lord's well was where? Samaria. Both of them, of course, we could speak of their shepherdhood, right? Moses, of course, in the literal sense, and our Lord in the sense of my flock, I have flocks you know not of, John 10, and so forth. Uh, both of them had a season of seclusion. Moses on the backside of the desert, and Jesus, of course, in his early years in the carpenter shop. And there may be even some others. Both had a commission from God. Both of them were sent forth, so we can speak of their apostleship. Both of them had credentials in the form of their miracles. Moses' miracles are the first miracles in the Old Testament. And of course, uh, our Lord's miracles are well documented throughout the Gospels. It's interesting that John the Baptist did none. The first miracles that um, Moses did had to do with a serpent and had to do with leprosy, Exodus 4. First miracles the Lord did was had to do with the power of Satan and with leprosy, Matthew 4 and chapter 8. Both of them uh, returned to their own land. In fact, that's kind of interesting, just to give you an example. Turn to Exodus 4. I'll just pick this one. We could, we could do this with all of them, really, so many places, but I'll just show you the kind of thing that I find interesting. Exodus 4, verse 19 says, And the Lord said unto Moses in Midian, remember he went to Midian, and he was there with the seven daughters and of, of uh, Jethro. And, and, uh, he said, and the Lord said to him, uh, Go return unto Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. Right? Now that is uh, Exodus 4.19. Matthew 2.19. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to, uh, in, a, in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. Isn't that interesting? They're both called to, to return to their own land. Well, we can go on. They both, had, of course, had powerful rods. Uh, Moses' rod we read about in Exodus chapter 9 and 10 and 14. Jesus Christ has a rod, too. It's mentioned in Psalm chapter 2, verse 9. It's a rod of what? A rod of iron. And that, that figures prominently in the book of Revelation. Both of them, of course, ran around predicting solemn judgments. Moses is well known. You can look at Luke 13, I guess, as an example there. Both of them were a deliverer. That's pretty obvious. Acts 7.35 and John 8.36 are examples there. Both of them, we can speak of their headship. They lead praise. Both of them had their authority challenged. Both of them had their persons envied. Moses is best documented in Psalm 106.16 and, of course, Mark 15.10 as an example. Both of them had their person opposed. Moses with all the murmurings in Exodus 15 and 16 and so forth. And, of course, our Lord in Luke 15 and, and uh, John 6. Both of them had their life threatened. Did you know that? You know, remember, Moses was going to be stoned in Exodus 17. And of course, John 8 and 10 have analogous situations with our Lord. Both of them had sorrows. Numbers 11 speaks of Moses' sorrows. And of course, Isaiah 53 and other passages speaks as our Lord, as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Both had an unwearied love. Exodus 32, we might looked at that last time in some depth of just how much Moses loved Israel. And, of course, our Lord's um, love is just amplified beautifully in John 13. Both had a forgiving love, Numbers 12, and the Lord in 1 Peter 2, 23. Both of them were very prayerful. Moses faced virtually every one of his crises with prayer. You can well study the prayers of Moses. It's very interesting. He didn't pussyfoot around. He really took his stuff to the Lord. Exodus 5, 22, 8, 12, 9, 33, 14, 15, 15, 25, and 17, 4. Places on the tape where it talks about some of the key prayer crises of Moses. And, of course, all through Luke is a good example of our Lord's prayerfulness. Their meekness is well documented. Their faithfulness is well documented. Both provided Israel with water. Moses did in Numbers uh, uh, 20 and, and John uh, 4, of course, is the living water passage for our Lord. Both had prophetic office. In Deuteronomy 18.18 18 is an example. 
and of course John 7, 16, and John 8, uh, 25, others. Both, both were engaged in priestly activities, Psalm 99, 6, Leviticus 8, and so on, and 15 and 16. Hebrews 9, 14 speaks of our Lord's high priestly activities. Both had a kingly rule, and that may surprise you, but Deuteronomy 33, verses 4 and 5, speak of, speaks of Moses in a kingly sense. And, of course, Luke chapter 1 promises a kingship role to our Lord and Savior. Both of them had a responsibility for judgeship, Exodus 18, 13, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Both of them, of course, uh, have comments on their leadership, Exodus 32, verse 34, and uh, the captain of salvation is our, our Lord's title in Hebrews 2, 10. Both of them were, uh, had a call of mediation, Deuteronomy 5.5, 5, plus many other passages for Moses. And our Lord is one mediator, Paul tells Timothy in his first letter, chapter 2, verse 5. Um, both of them were considered subjects of God's election. Now, with Moses, that's no surprise. In Psalm 106, verse 23, he's spoken of as his chosen. In Isaiah 42.1, Jesus himself is referred to as mine elect. We normally don't think of our Lord as being elected, but nevertheless, there's a sense at least in which the prophet Isaiah in chapter 42 uses that term of our Lord. Both of them had a covenant engagement, Exodus 34, 27 for Moses, Hebrew 8, 6 for our Lord. Now here's the interesting thing. Both of them sent forth 12. Moses sent forth 12 uh, spies or witnesses or whatever in the Numbers 13. Remember? Only two of them brought back an acceptable message and caused uh, the, the other 10 by uh, being, being more persuasive, unfortunately, caused 40 years to be wasted. Joshua, when he enters the land, figures two were enough to get a good message in the first time, sends two forth into uh, Jericho. But, of course, they have nothing to do with military intelligence. They have to do with the witnessing and the salvation of Rahab. So they're really two witnesses um, going to get out a Gentile bride eventually, and so forth. Um, anyway, there's a whole thing there. Matthew 10.5 is an example of our Lord sending forth 12. But did you know that Moses appointed 70 in Numbers 11, verse 24? And our lo Lord appointed how many? 70 in Luke 10, verse 1. Both of them have their wisdom commented on. Moses in Acts 7.22, our Lord in Colossians 2.3. They have their might commented on in similar passages, Matthew 13.34, and so on. Both of them made intercession, Numbers 27.5 and Hebrews 7.25. Both of them had intimate communion with God. Moses, of course, in Exodus 34.10, and uh, John 1.18, and other passages for our Lord. Both had uh, special knowledge of God, Psalm 103, verse 7, for Moses, and John 5.20, for our Lord. Both of them had uh, evidence of holy anger, Mark 3.5, for our Lord, Exodus 32.9, for Moses. We talk about their message, about the commandments they received, their written revelation, their habits of fasting, but even the transfiguration. Moses in Exodus 34, we've just seen, and of course Matthew 17 is a, the other example. Both of them had a place outside the camp. Exodus 33, 7, Hebrews 13, 13. Both of them um, were seen arraigning the responsible head of uh, apostasy. Moses in Exodus 32, 21, and our Lord in the Letters to Seven Churches, chapter Revelation 2, 12, and 13. Both of them pray for Israel's forgiveness in Numbers 14, 17, and in Luke 23, 34. Both of them um, uh, washed their brethren with water. Moses in Leviticus 8, 6, and of course uh, our Lord in John 13. Uh, both of them are seen rewarding God's servants, Numbers 7 and 32 and so on, and Revelation 22, 12. Both of them had uh, complete obedience, Exodus 40, 16 and John 16, 10. Both of them were seen erecting a tabernacle, Exodus 40, verse 2. And where does our Lord do that? In Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. Both are seen having completed the work they were to do. Uh, Exodus 40, 33, and of course our Lord speaks of his work being completed to the Father in his prayer to the Father in John 17, verse 4. Both of them pronounce a blessing on the people. Both of them anoint God's house, Leviticus 8, Acts 2. 
Both of them had death for the benefit of God's people. Now, the Lord, of course, that's obvious with the cross. In Moses, we see him portrayed that way in Psalm 106, verse 32, and Deuteronomy, I think it's 3, 26. Uh, both of them appointed another to follow them. Moses did that in Deuteronomy 31, verse 23. Our Lord did that in John 14, 16 and 18. Remember? The paraclete, the comforter. Both of them were given an inheritance, the land in... in uh, in, the, in Joshua 1.14, and uh, the Lord's inheritance is spoken of in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Both of them have their death described as a necessary prerequisite. Joshua 1, verse 2, and John chapter 12, or 21, in our Lord's case. Both of them are scheduled for a second appearing. Matthew 17 is a good example of that. Now, I've just run through the flavor of the kinds of things that would be in the outline if I had done it on time. There's a few things that still are not uh, focused here. Moses took a Gentile bride. I think that's interesting. Moses uh, made a second um, descent from the mount. And there's questions of keeping the Sabbath and other things, and that's the... We Incidentally, we just went through about 75 comparisons. Yeah, a little... Maybe not that exciting. On the other hand, it's kind of provocative. Moses was the deliverer, the deliverer of his people. And uh, so is our Lord. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we praise you that you are indeed the living God, that you not only have created us and placed us here, but that you've intervened in our lives, that you have orchestrated circumstances to bring us where we are tonight. We thank you, Father, for your revealed word, which goes far beyond the visibility that the creation gives us of your magnificent interest, your love, your power, your caring, your planning on our behalf. We would ask you, Father, to go further. We would ask you, Father, to give us no peace until we rest in thee. Increase in us, Father, a hunger for knowledge of you and your plan of redemption for our souls of the person and work and claims of your Son, Jesus Christ. We would ask you, Father, to take us and stubbornly, without any break, keep us in thy will. Don't let us go, Father, until we commit ourselves completely into your care. We ask all these things, Father, that we might indeed fellowship with you throughout eternity, that we might indeed be pleasing in thy sight, that we might indeed fulfill that goal you have created us for, for fellowship with thee and thy pleasure. We ask all these things that Jesus, the name of Jesus, might be glorified. Amen.